Hello, my name is Chris Jervis and I'm giving this talk on the 5th of May 2023, the very eve of the coronation of King Charles III. It's part of a series of talks for Thank God for Friday, TGFF, which are conducted in the Blackmoor Vale of Dorset in England. Now, there's a sequential series for 12 consecutive months taking us through the great biblical narrative and coincidentally, this on the eve of the coronation of King Charles III is on the theme of biblical kingship. So we'll be looking at that and making application particularly relevant to what's happening this weekend and of course to our lives. So our theme then is kingship. Tomorrow then is the coronation of our King Charles III. Now Charles I came to a rather sticky end when he was executed at Whitehall in January 1649. A couple of years later, Charles II was defeated by Oliver Cromwell's forces and having been defeated, he fled to France where he was in exile for about nine years. Oliver Cromwell died and Charles II came back to these lands, these islands, and resumed his kingship. And that lasted for 25 years. And it's quite a chequered period. Some of it was good. He was quite popular, but some was very difficult. And now we've reached the point in 2023 when we're going to uh, have King Charles III, his coronation tomorrow. Of course, he became king eight months ago on the death of his mother, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth. So tomorrow then we wish that King Charles III, whatever your royal affiliations, we wish for him a just, a peaceful and a godly reign. Being a monarch has many, many privileges, but it's also pretty tough. It has lots of difficulties and pressures. So we do pray that King Charles will be a good and godly king in his period of reign. I want to take you back. We're taking these sequential steps through the biblical narrative. Let's go back 4,000 years God had selected this Hebrew man, Abraham, to be the head of a family, a tribe, and then subsequently a nation. And they were called to be his ambassadors, his representatives in the world, so that they may be a source of great blessing to all humanity. However, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, had to take them away from any promised land into Egypt because of great economic famine and hardship. They found themselves moving into Egypt as food migrants. And there they stayed for 400 years and the family of Jacob, that tribe, became a great and numerous people group. Hebrews living in servitude at the end of that time under Pharaoh's rule. Moses became a spokesman and a leader for them and eventually led them out of that captivity. God intervened through a series of plagues and Moses led the people out of that captivity in Egypt. Once the Hebrew people had left Egypt, it took them a four, further four decades before they eventually entered into the promised land of Canaan. And during that time, God led them splendidly and gloriously and directly through a pillar of fire, pillar of smoke and the Ark of the Covenant. And in all those things, Moses was the mouthpiece for God. It was a theocratic rule. And these signs of fire and smoke and the Ark of the Covenant were theophanies. They were ways of God being present with his people and being their king, if you like. He was their leader a theocratic rule. Now after the Hebrew people settled into their new promised land under the leadership of Joshua, they established themselves into tribal groupings distributed around the territory. And Joshua, who had succeeded Moses, acted, if you like, as their first leader. And eventually these different tribes appointed judges, judges who would govern them, uh, exercise justice in their domain, and some of them were good, some of them were bad. Many were just local and parochial. And some of them really led sort of makeshift armies to repel aggressors. So this period of judges was very influential. And some of these were people of very great courage. 
as remarked as is remarked upon in Hebrews chapter 11. Well, after 150 years of these judges, the nation of Israel asked this renowned judge come prophet Samuel, they asked that God give them a king. And Samuel had tried to basically enact, put into practice uh, an hereditary um, series of judges. He appointed his own sons, but they became corrupt and that was disastrous. So eventually the people said, appoint for us a king to judge us like the other nations. That's 1 Samuel chapter 8. Appoint for us a king like the other nations. We want the same. Samuel was displeased with this. But God said, let them have what they want. Give them what they're requesting. And God said this, the people have not rejected you, Samuel. They've not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. God had been their king. And now he is being rejected. Give us an earthly king like the other nations. Now, despite all the warnings about the potential for monarchical rule and becoming self-serving, corrupt, dangerous. Nevertheless, the people were insistent and God granted them their wish. So Saul became the first king of Israel, of this really confederation of 12 tribes. Saul started well. Uh, he knew God's blessing uh, and God's spiritual enabling. He was gifted in those things by God. But things went pear-shaped. David came on the scene. He, he became the king in waiting, if you like. And suddenly, paranoia, envy, jealousy, rage overtook Saul. It was terrible. Well, David did become a great and a glorious king, renowned king of all Israel. He was a ruler with feet of clay. We know about his sin with Bathsheba, etc., but he was described in Acts, in the New Testament, Acts 13, as a man after God's own heart. The nation prospered. God was honoured and David established himself as a model king for that time. In so many ways he was a model king. But there's an interesting point of comparison between the selection of Saul to be the first king and then the selection of David and his appointment. In Saul, the people in general looked up to this character. He was taller than them, he was more handsome, he was more imposing, he looked the part, and in every sense, we, we want this guy. This is the guy to be our king. But when David was appointed, it was interesting that God had told Samuel that the next king who would replace Saul was to come from the family of Jesse. And Jesse had a number of sons, and so Saul went to meet Jesse's family, and one after another, these sons were presented to the prophet. And Samuel saw these characters turn up one after another, all very strong, handsome, leadership quality. And when it got to one of them, Eliab, um, God said these famous words. He said this, do not look on his appearance or on his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. See this comparison between the election of Saul and then David. In terms of Saul, head and shoulders above the rest, great leadership quality in the world's eyes, but David was a man after God's own heart and that was the difference. So eventually David came before Samuel and God said, this is the one. All the other brothers have been rejected, but of David, this is the one. Now, whilst David was a good-looking chap, fair enough, the Bible tells us that, it was his heart's disposition which rendered him as the right choice. I think it's very notable that our late monarch, Queen Elizabeth, was often described as being servant-hearted. You see, the heart's disposition made her suitable for leadership in that way, and that was true of David. Well, let's cut this history lesson short, quickly rattle through some other bits. David's reign was remarkable in many ways, despite obvious human failings. Solomon then followed and he started well, but then he adopted syncretistic uh, religious practices, woeful alliances with other nations. He became corrupt. Rehoboam and De uh, Jeroboam 
ruled over divided parts of the kingdom, Judah and Israel respectively. And there followed a whole series of good, bad and pretty indifferent leaders, many of whom succumbed to the corrupting influence of power at some stage in their reign. Eventually, the ten northern tribes, collectively known as Israel, um, were conquered by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC. And they were assimilated, deported, assimilated, and they lost their identity. And that was the end of them in the 8th century. A couple of centuries later, the two southern tribes, collectively known as Judah, were captured by the Babylonians. But later in that same century, after a period of about 70 years, they were released to come back to their country, courtesy of the Persians. So they remained, whereas the others were lost. But here's an interesting point. What emerged in the 8th century was a number of prophets, and it's from the 8th century onwards. And these prophets who spoke from God, they stirred the hearts of God's people to anticipate a special king. They'd seen good kings like David. They'd seen some pretty grotty kings too. But the hearts were stirred to anticipate a special king who would come from God. And we're given some clues about this king. This who'd become as a child born of a virgin, we're told in Isaiah. He would be known as the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He'd have all these nicknames particularly applicable to him. He would be one whose government would never end. One who would rule with justice and with peace. All these things were said of this special king who would come. This king will be born within the family line of David's father Jesse, we're told in Isaiah. His birthplace, we're told in Micah, would be the town of Bethlehem. Even though he is from everlasting, Isaiah 9. This king's rule will be forevermore. In humility, there'll be a day when this king will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Particularly noteworthy. That's Zechariah chapter 9. Such a king, the ideal king, will stand in marked contrast to these earthly rulers. Although some of qualities which we've witnessed have been those of good governance, and they will point to the very perfection of those qualities, when this everlasting special king comes. And no earthly monarch has ever matched that image of the ideal king. And then, several centuries after these prophetic words, a teenage girl from Nazareth humbly agreed to be part of God's remarkable plan. The virgin conception was enacted the journey to Bethlehem was forced upon this pregnant girl and shepherds were alerted by the angelic choir in words which really echoed Isaiah's prophecy. They heard these words, Unto you is born this night in the city of David a saviour who is Christ the Lord. The word Christ or Messiah, it means God's anointed one or God's anointed king. During his ministry, Jesus had to resist numerous temptations from various quarters to interpret his kingship merely in earthly, temporal and territorial ways. Even though Jesus had announced his arrival by, by saying, as he came and launched his ministry, the kingdom of God is near, Mark chapter 1. But that was never to be thought of merely in temporal terms. Let me give you some examples some noteworthy examples. Do you remember the temptations? The devil took Jesus to a high mountain, pointed out all the territories he could see and said, I'll give you the lot. That's a false offer. He had no authority to do that. I'll give you the lot if you bow down and worship me. You know, become a territorial leader. No. Worship the Lord only. Lord your God only. And then when Jesus had fed the 5,000, it tells us in John chapter 6 that uh, and verse 15, it, it, that he perceived that the crowds, having experienced this miracle, wanted to take him and make him king, and so he escaped from their presence. So these were attempts to interpret his kingship in earthly terms. And then in John 18, 
verses 33 to 38, you've got this remarkable occasion when Jesus is before Pontius Pilate, an earthly ruler. And this poor Roman official really is floundering, trying to make sense of Jesus being a king. And Jesus affirms that, yes, indeed, he is a king, but not in this world's terms. Pilate was floundering, unable or unwilling to make sense of Jesus' kingly authority. If this king, this ideal king, who will be forever, is not to govern a territory or a temporal kingdom, in what sense is he king? Or to give him his full title, King of Kings? The answer to this must involve two phases. Two phases of his governance. The first, he rules now in the hearts and the minds of innumerable men, women, boys and girls throughout the world who give him their rightful honour as their king. They give him unwavering allegiance. There are those who object to the monarchy in this country and they say, not my king. But I can say of this ideal king, Jesus, he is my king. And many can say the same. In other words, Jesus rules in the hearts and the minds of all who put their faith in him and to acknowledge his regal authority. Jesus is saviour and lord. Phase one, phase two. A day will come when Jesus Christ returns and when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That's Philippians chapter 2. He will be universally acclaimed as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And all dissenting voices will be silenced. All rebellious hearts will be defeated. In 1815, after Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated in the Napoleonic Wars, this French leader, warrior leader, was deported and sent on exile. It was a 10-week sea journey to the mid-Atlantic island of St Helena. And there he was sent 1,200 miles away from any other landmass, is west off the west coast of Africa, 1,200 miles, the island of St Helena. And there he was guarded by the 53rd Shropshire Regiment until his death on, in 1821 on, here's an interesting date, this day, the 5th of May, 202 years ago, he died. Now, whilst on St Helena, Napoleon spent much of his time writing, but he also had very famous discourses with one of his generals who was over there, Bernard, who, um, and in one discourse, Bernard was trying to persuade him there's no God and religion's nonsense, etc., etc. And Napoleon famously said this, he said, I know men, and I tell you, Jesus Christ is not just a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is, between Christianity and other religions, the distance of infinity. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, myself. We've founded empires, but on what did we rest these creations of our genius? Upon sheer force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men will die for him. In every other existence but that of Christ, how many imperfections. From the first day to the last, he is the same, majestic and simple, infinitely firm and infinitely gentle. He proposes to our faith a series of mysteries and commands with authority that we should believe them, giving no other reason than those tremendous words, I am God. Well, that leaves us to reflect upon what it means for us today, here, to say that Jesus Christ is my King. What does it mean? What does it look like in practice from day to day? Tomorrow, the 6th of May, 2023, 
Charles Windsor will be crowned King Charles III after service in Westminster Abbey. He will receive the jewel bedecked golden crown of St Edward the Confessor. He will receive a scepter, in fact two scepters. Both of these are symbolic of the great power and authority which is invested in him. We know in a constitutional monarchy that's principally influence rather than power. But he will also receive a golden orb, a globe, made of gold and with a cross on the top. And this depicts the world. So King Charles III has a rule, a kingship, a regal role within this world. But on the top is a cross. And that is there to indicate to and to remind King Charles of the fact that his kingship is only exercised under the supreme regal authority of the one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in that sense, whether you're positioned at home in a comfy chair or like Charles on the wooden seat of Edward the Confessor or in a church pew, wherever you're seated, we are all called upon to bow the knee before the one who is the true King, our Sovereign Lord, our Saviour Jesus Christ. See, this is not just a constitutional monarchy. He is not merely, Jesus is not merely a figurehead or a holder of numerous complementary titles of office. Jesus is King indeed, my King, whom to serve is perfect freedom. The one whose just and gentle rule shall govern my life each and every day and through all eternity. Jesus is king. Therein lies true kingship. <laughs>